And then I'm pleased to have Connie Kramer as our guest speaker tonight. Um, she does a fabulous job. We had her out to Go Red Ladies Night, and she awed us then. And then, because she's a horse person, and she'll <laughs> explain that, I also had her speak at the annual Posse Dinner this past March. I think it was, it was cold yet. Yeah, so. it was cold yet. And um, with no further ado, I'd Thank like to you, turn Louise. our program over to Connie. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, the uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to meet Louise, and um, you, you really, I have to credit her because you're, um, you're so engaged in community events here with um, efforts to educate, and I think that she's kind of a powerhouse behind that, and you know, I'm 100% behind education every chance I can, so learning and absorbing it and making the most of it, uh, support her with her things, you'll never regret that time. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Um, I'm a very, very fortunate and blessed person. And um, I need to tell you, the name of my business is Integrate Cleaning and Organizing. Some people say Integrate, because yep, that's what we do. Um, I like to think about it a little bit with integrity. Um, integrity without the why because in my opinion um, I see an aging population especially we're on the beginning of the cusp of the baby boomers retiring and um, I see in my line of work a lot of things I don't like to see where uh, families are unable to take care of their senior family members or the senior family members don't have the, the means to take care of themselves correctly. And then we run into some bad situations. And I'll get into that a little further on. But um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm just a farm kid. And I grew up, um, I'm number two of nine children. And um, so as number two and being one of two girls my sister is quite she's at the other end of the spectrum um, i had seven brothers on a farm lots of laundry lots of potatoes <laughs> to peel um, and uh, so i was couldn't wait to be in the barn all the time my dad means the world to me um, he passed away two years ago he was 90 years old and I think about all the things I learned from my dad and his accomplishments in his life after he returned from World War II out in the South Pacific, Iwo Jima, Saipan, places like that. And then he came home and he farmed and he was successful and he built a home and he bred some of the best Michigan Holstein cattle and Belgian horses. And I had the privilege of seeing him in action. And um, so a lot of the things that I learned throughout my lifetime uh, I attribute to my parents. My mother was the oldest of 11, and um, so my ironing skills, I credit to my mom. Um, I thought that was a blast. And I will tell you that uh, to this day, I love to iron. I must be a wacko, but I love to iron. And give me up, bring on the pleats. Bring on the pleats, because I'll do it. Um, but um, my, uh, my life, we had a grade A dairy. And this thing up here is called a roller measure. I don't know if any of you grew up on a dairy farm, but before pipelines went automatically down into a plate cooler system to immediately cool milk on a dairy farm, first the milk would come out of the cow, and this was, bef this was before um, the big pipeline systems, but after, uh, this was about circa 1960-ish. And this was what the milk went into before people had the buckets under each cow, or after, I should say. So this roller measure thing here, okay, sat in your parlor. And my dad and I would scrub the roller measures because, as you know, um, dairy facilities, grade A dairy facilities are highly regulated. They're very inspected and oftentimes the inspector um, doesn't just check for cleanliness on the inside but especially on the outside too. So it's a food processing plant. So my job used to be with my dad, we would scrub these roller measures 
And one of the first things I learned about quality and quality control was my dad was scrubbing one roller measure and I was scrubbing the one next to him and we rinsed it off with the hose and I was like, look at my roller measure. And then my dad said, is that good enough? And then I looked at his and it was like, oh, and I, I said, no. And I had to redo that roller measure because underneath all of these little lines dirt would hold and the difference between the two of our roller measures was huge. It was a small, small thing in, in today, but for me it was a real in-your-face education about how important the details are. So then when I got a little bit bigger, I graduated to this. Now let me tell you, that patent leather harness, that took quite a bit of cleaning. And we showed our draft horses, our Belgians, um, locally at the state level and internationally. And um, my job before a show was to clean all that harness and then to clean the whatever wagon or cart we used. And then I got to scrub the horse. So I stood on step ladders or five gallon buckets and I scrubbed. And so the fetlocks were clean and the ears were cleaned and it was, but what a, what a learning education. Very physical, but it was a wonderful thing to do, especially when it was 98 degrees. So, um, so this is my humble beginnings and it was a lot of work, but my, my dad knew how to make work fun. And so it was like he would learn as I was cleaning the parts of the harness, I learned, uh, I learned what the names of them were, which today is kind of a, a lost trait. Now, I didn't like it so good after I had kid number three of my four, and my dad said, oh no, Con, gee, Con, you're kind of filling the britchin. Now, do you know what the britchin is? It's the strap that goes around the horse's rear end. So in farmer, farmer talk, it was like, hmm, your butt got a little bigger. So, but anyway, that was my dad's humor. And uh, I would do, uh, I'd get on my hands and knees and crawl to have my dad back with all the knowledge he had. In the meantime, in the house, taking care of seven brothers with my mom and cooking and cleaning and everything, um, those are skills that a lot of young people don't have anymore today. We had a window display that we put together in my shop just the other day, and I had pulled out all my antique aprons. I've got an apron collection. And one of my staff members was gonna iron it. And I said, you have to be careful, that's organdy. She said, no, it's an apron. I said, but it's organdy, it's made out of organdy. They don't, young people unfortunately don't even know distinctions between types of fabric. So um, there's always something to learn. What I do in my business, um, and I'll, I'll give you a piece of paper that lists everything we do. We are very varied. We do residential cleaning, office cleaning. We do basements, garages, and attics. We do all kinds of things. This is a picture, a before and after picture, of a cat lover household <laughs> and what we did afterward. And um, this, was on someone's, this was on a person's ceiling, and it hung down about this far. So that's how much cat hair floats through the air and gets trapped up in this, you know. So um, what we're finding is that there's people who, I mean, we all, we love pets, dogs, cats, bird, whatever it might be, um, but that as some folks age, they don't smell like they used to, they can't hear like they used to, and they can't see what they used to. And perhaps they were had the most pristine, clean home, and it's just evolution, okay? This is what happens when we get older. We need some help. And so um, it's our job when we see these kinds of things to go in and help folks who just need a little bit of extra help. So we cover the entire upper thumb, and um, I can tell you lots of stories um, about hoarders and collectors and about family members who pretend that their parents don't even exist and don't want to be involved in helping them at all. And I can tell you 
the opposite story where kids come in and do everything in their power to help their aging parents to keep them in their homes as long as they can. I, um, I personally find this job very gratifying because um, the instant gratification part of it is that we can turn around and we can see what we accomplished right now. The windows are clean, the, this house is clean, the floor is done, whatever. Instant gratification. The long-term gratification is if we can leave and someone's life is better. And if they're happy in their home, that's for me a huge thing. Now, we talked a little, today is about stress equals mess. And the science studies are coming in by the gobs these days. More and more studies are indicating how much effect clutter or a messy home or things not being put away or the things that sit around the home and pile up how much of an effect that has on your life so it's not always a happy subject but it's one that has resolved to it there's a there's a light at the end of the tunnel um, people are bombarded today especially young people have you heard about how many young people are depressed or have anxiety and it's like, what do you have to, now I'm, I have great faith, okay? I'm a, um, I go to church regularly, I'm on church committees, and I feel like my life has been so fortunate, um, and I love working. Get me on my hands and knees, I'll work right along any coworker I have. But when I hear about people who are battling anxiety and depression and things like that, for me, it's almost like a foreign concept because I say, look at what we have. Look at all the wonderful things we have. We have, um, we have, at least in my world, I'm blessed with good family. My kids are healthy. My grandkids are healthy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a job that consumes me, so I'm never bored. I love to read. I've got a horse, and I share the horse interests like Louise, and so... I never really realized until I was doing a lot of research about the effects of these kind of things on folks with sleep, sleep disturbance and weight issues. And the weight issue I have is because I love it all. You know, feed me. Um, cognitive impairment, um, intestinal upsets, drug and alcohol addiction or abuse, fertility or female problems, chronic illness, all of these things come back to these things on the top, anxiety and depression. And the clutter mind, actually there's four parts of your health that it, it affects. And so um, when you can't sit down in your home and relax, or you can't do a project because you don't feel like you deserve to do the project because you have other things you should be doing, then that's where some of this um, psychologically comes in. So um, we've got, str everybody has stressors in their life. You know, family, you've got the one. Okay, I was working with a grandma, and this was up by Elkton. And uh, we went in regularly and helped this grandma. Our goal was to help her downsize and minimize over time, but at the same time, clean her house. And I went downstairs to get a bucket of hot water out of her laundry, her big laundry tub. And I looked over, and there were four men in her basement. And there was obvious paraphernalia uh, drug-related paraphernalia on the table and our rule for my business is we immediately exit any place that's like that I don't want anybody saying that we brought that kind of stuff in and I don't want my people anywhere near anything like that that is a hazard so I went back upstairs and I said to this grandma there are four men sleeping in your basement and she said oh no it's just my grandson it's just my grandson and I said, no, there's four men down there and there's things on the table that I know are not good. And I said, our rule is for the safety of my employees, we, we leave, we vacate. Well, that grandma kind of hobbled down to the steps. She called me later, about a week later, and told me. She looked, took one look and went back up the steps and called the sheriff's department and told them there were strangers in her basement and she had no idea who they were. They were all passed out from using drugs. And here's poor grandma who didn't have a clue. She knew this, the grandson was down there playing music and whatever, but, and he was staying for a few weeks because he lost his job somewhere else. 
I'm sad to tell you that these are the kinds of things that we're running into more and more and more. So when we talk about family issues, I'm a grandma too, and I can't imagine not doing any, I would do anything for my grandkids. But we also have to be strong enough to realize that if the grandkid has problems, we're gonna have to be strong enough to drop the hammer and say, not in my house. I've already dealt with grandmas and grandpas who um, thought that they had things of value in their home and they were pilfered by family members right under their nose and they didn't know about it. Maybe grandma was in the hospital for rehab and she came home and things are gone out of her house. And these things just are like a punch in the gut because um, that's not how family's supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to rely on them. And I only tell you this to give you strength to realize that nobody has, the per nobody has a perfect family. And um, my dad used to say, or my mother used to say, if you want the truth, ask an alcoholic or a child, you know, because that they're gonna say it like it is. So I'm giving you permission to tell the truth too, to your family. Lay it on the line to them. And if they don't like you, maybe you will be the one caveat that helps them to change their world. Um, jobs, more people than ever are um, full-time employees outside the home. The job market is, you know, there's people everywhere with help wanted signs out. Um, but when you have a mom with kids in school and she's working full-time, um, she's under stress because the work doesn't stop when she leaves her position. She comes home and there's children who need things and there's a home to take care of and so jobs, um, no matter what your age, there's, um, you give your world, your life to that job, and then you come home and you still have to, you're exhausted, you're tired, and then you feel guilty because your home isn't pristine. So the pets one up there, the biggest thing I'll tell you about pets is I love pets, I love, you, you name it, I'm an animal girl, um, but if you're gonna have pets, then you have to remember they have to be taken care of and your home will have odors to accompany those pets. And that's okay, it's your home. And there are little creatures. And I mean, I love dogs that bark when someone strange comes in the driveway. And uh, you know, it's, it is our job then to take care of the pets right. And there was one lady who called me and I went and did an evaluation for her. She said, um, I don't know what's going on in my house. I just, I'm just renting this house. It was a furnished apartment. And we went in there and I could tell by looking at her, she was bit up by fleas. The former, the former um, tenant there had all kinds of, I don't know, cats or dogs or whatever, but the flea problem was still there and the fleas were hungry. <laughs> so they were, they were getting their supper from her. So, you know, again, it's, um, and the issue of elderly with pets, um, litter boxes are hard to change when you have trouble bending over or heavy, lifting heavy things. I mean, a thing of kitty litter is average, is, average is 40 pounds. Um, if they don't have help to do some of those things, we can run into issues where it's an uncleanly situation. Um, and then when the elderly person has a situation where they're in the hospital or something, then the biggest thing they're worried about is their pets. I'm dealing with the situation right now where I'm not quite sure how it's all gonna end. I was called to help with a, a home clean out, elderly couple looking to minimize and downsize. The wife is going through cancer treatments. Um, the husband has some health issues. Um, they have eight cats outside that they take care of. They have nine cats inside. Um, the lady cannot afford to buy her medicine, but their cats are up to date on all of their vaccines, all of their flea treatments, all of their, um, their food is great. And I, I said to them, I'm going to talk to you like I'm your daughter. You are more important than the cats right now. You have got to be able to have your medicine. So, but her, her whole world was her, her cats. So um, these are just a few of the things that I'm running into. There's a difference between hoarding and collecting. Guilty, guilty as charged. Some days, I, I know I am this one right here, okay? Especially Louise, I have lots of tack out in my 
tack room because I might need it. I might need it. Um, and then this one, thankfully, I haven't quite made that level. But um, the difference between the scientific difference between hoarders and collectors is that a true blue collector will have all of their, they know where all of their collection pieces are. They have them many times on spreadsheets or categorized. They know the values of them and they have a plan for them. Okay? A hoarder um, is um, this person, this person, I rent, my gut just wrenches for them. Um, they did not plan on that. They didn't want that. Most cases of hoarding is a direct result of some kind of PTSD. They're dealing with something, unresolved issue, that is just clobbering them on the side of the head, and this is how they deal with it. A lot of times it comes back to that other list that we saw earlier with um, family issues. Uh, it can be triggered by traumatic divorce situations or death, uh, suicide of a spouse or family member. Um, it is a coping mechanism, okay? Sometimes it's genetic, if mom kept everything. And I'll take you back to something that um, we all can kind of relate to, the, de the Great Depression, okay? After the Great Depression, because those people lived through it, they were told to waste not, they were told to use it up, wear it out, that there was a second life, recycle it. There was always something that you could do with that item. And to throw something away that had purpose or value was a sin. And that at the very least you could turn around and you could use that for something else. Coats were cut down to make quilts. Uh, the um, cloths were used for rags. Um, there, was just, there was always something that you could use that for. There's different kinds of hoarding. I've been in hoarding situations that I call them the clean hoarder and a hoarder who is not clean. The not clean hoarder is where we have actual trash blended in with items. A clean hoarder is someone who this has gotten out of control. Uh, recently cleaned a home in Cass City, could not open three bedroom doors because it was so full. Um, cleaned a crawl space not too long ago, um, and it was a cemented crawl space. So I put my um, my knee, my construction knee pads on, and I developed. I don't know how many of you ever saw the old World War II movie, where the guys escaped in the German POW camp, and they were um, they dug a tunnel. Did any of you remember seeing that old movie? Um, it's one of my favorites, but I like old history movies. But anyway. Um, I knew I had to clean out this crawl space. It was huge. It was the size of the house, and it was full. So the, um, the very, f and, and for m some of my staff are like, I'm not, I'm not going in there. Uh, is there spiders in there? And, but I have ways. I go in there and blast them with killer first and all that. I believe in chemical warfare when it comes to spiders. <laughs> so anyway, the, um, what I did was, when you go on trail rides with horses, oftentimes you have a toboggan so that you can pull your hay around on it or your tack or water or whatever. And I had purchased a couple of toboggans for that purpose. Well, I had my husband drill extra hole in the one end, so I have the tie on each end. Then I had some horse fencing. It's the plastic kind that's about this wide and it has stainless through it. So I tied a big, long amount on each end. And I told my staff, when I say pull, you get these things unloaded. And I had those young people who work for me running like crazy because we had to go upstairs, down a hallway, and out on the front lawn. And within two hours, less than two hours, we had that crawl space empty because I could just pull that and zing that toboggan right back to me, load it up again, say pull, and I had two of them going. <laughs> and when I came out of the crawl space, I did have a few webs in my hair, but they kind of blended in. And um, ended up um, going out and the front lawn was covered. We filled a 20 yard dumpster that day. And it was sad because there were things there. I saw some of the most well-designed 
tailored 1940s and 50s dresses that were <coughs> lined and beautiful, but they had been there so long that they were full of mold and mildew. And there's a, there comes a time where you just can't repair something. And so um, into the dumpster, those beautiful dresses had to go. And you know, it's, it's the point I'm trying to make with this is there's a purpose for saving things. And if you have someone in mind that you want to have something down the day, hand it down to them someday, you need to create a memory to go with that. So for example, when, um, when you're dealing with uh, things that are too big or you have family members that are dealing with too much work, house is full, if grandma hasn't made memories with those things, if grandma hasn't served on her good china with her grandkids, why do we expect the grandkids to have a memory or think it's valuable to them? If the memory wasn't made around that kitchen table with grandma's special silverware and her goblets and her goofy mugs, then why do we expect a kid to have a memory associated with that and want it? The other thing you have to understand is that people under 40 now, especially, they want the experiences in life. They don't want to collect things in life. They don't want grandma's things. So for all of the grandmas and grandpas out there who are hanging on to things, thinking they're going to pass them down, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you, you need to ask them, do you want it? Do you even want it? Why am I saving it? And if they don't want it, then cash it in, Grandma. Because unfortunately, I watched um, one of our services that we do is we actually haul household items over to Albrecht Auction in Vassar. Okay? Um, the last probably six weeks that I've been there, I always inspect the things that do not sell. Falls Graph dishes are not selling. Nortaki dishes are not selling. They don't want those anymore. Uh, bone china, it's not selling. The kids are like, if we have a party at our house for Thanksgiving, in comes the pizza boxes and the paper plates so nobody has to stand by the sink washing dishes all night. So there's a little bit of evolution going on. But if you have something, you know, if I have a curio cabinet that my dad made me. Um, it's a walnut curio cabinet. It's got some of my cool things on it. My kids want that. They're kind of fighting over some of my better pieces of wood because they were in the wood shop when Grandpa was making it. They remember him making it. So it's time to haul out the things you have and have the tea party with your granddaughters or use it for special occasions and make the memories of it or the dishes that your mom saved for you whose mother saved it for her or her mother saved it for her are not going to be in your family anymore. And it's just important that when you are in the midst of all this, you can ask for help. Because you know what? Everybody gets weekends off here and there and everybody gets vacation time, everybody gets Thanksgiving weekend off, whatever, tell them to do Black Friday shopping in your house instead of going out. Which brings up some of these things can never be replicated anymore. You know, and some of the good wood furniture and some of the specialty items that the quality that's in some of these items cannot be replicated anymore in today's marketplace without spending huge high-end custom-made dollars. So if you have something that is in your home that you want to stay, don't wait until they're reading your will. Give it to them now. Watch them enjoy it. There's no greater feeling than having someone n have it, understand the story. Tell me again, Grandma, what happened here? Oh, that came over on the ship when Grandma emigrated from Belgium and um, and then she broke five pieces and we had to find the pieces and you know tell them the story tell them why it should mean something to them if you want the pieces to remain in your family you have to make a memory with them so in the other side of that um, the whole reason that one of the reasons I started this business was because I worked, I worked out of Detroit. I was a financial 
um, asset consultant and a public relations and marketing person. I covered the entire thumb when I was doing that. And um, well, for one thing, I would come home and my farmer men in my life, um, you know, because they're always in a hurry. They don't have time to take off their shoes. Um, their life is more important, right? So they would tramp across, tramp across the room, dump their things wherever, leave the dishes in the sink, you know, er. So the, um, I was trying to find someone, I was putting in a lot of hours because as a farmer, I have a hard time shutting work off when it's not done. And so I thought, well, at least if I can find someone coming to home. Well, I couldn't find someone that would show up when they were supposed to show up and who did the work like I wanted it done. And then I tried to find another person to help my mom and dad out because I used to do all those kinds of things for my folks. So one day I was taking mom and dad to do some lawyer work. We were actually working on the estate work and pulled back in the driveway of my mom and dad's house and I ran into the house to use the bathroom quick because by the time I would come back out, it would be time to help them. They would be walker ready. <laughs> and as I'm going past the living room, I look in and the gal that I hired to come in and help my mom and dad, she was relaxing on the couch with her feet up, eating some chips, watching TV. And I was like, I'm paying for that. So we had a little chat and I said, have a great life. You're out of here. But I couldn't find anyone that um, treated it or treated them like my mom and dad deserve to be treated. And if there's anything in this world that I would admit, admit to is like, um, my my love for my parents, my respect for my parents, and the old thing called honor thy father and mother means a great deal to me. And I wanted them taken care of right. And after numerous times of not being able to find someone, I said, okay, I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm not happy with how things are at home. I don't like how things are at mom and dad's house. And health conditions were starting to escalate. And so I said goodbye to the big paying job and ventured out and did this. Because I already know how to do the work. And now it's kind of rewarding because I have young people come in and they, they'll actually say to me, how do you know all this stuff? And first I tell them because I'm old <laughs> and I've been around the block a few times. But the biggest thing is because I had two people who took the time to teach me. And so that's, Take the time to teach. If someone in your family shows an interest in your china or your crystal, tell them you don't put it in the dishwasher. You know, that this, is, this takes a little effort. Tell them you dust with the grain on the furniture. And, you know, help them to learn about the quality that they have. So, so don't hesitate to ask for help. And then what you want to do is, um, tell your kids what you want for Christmas. No, I don't want another shirt to go with the 50 other ones in my drawer. Um, no, I don't. Tell them you want something like um, a service or you want them to come in and do something for you or you want them to haul something away and tell them that's what I want for my birthday. That's what I want. Um, we have these things in our family that I developed and it is a Christmas list and you put down what you want, whether it's gift certificates to something or whatever. That way you get what you want. We don't need another thing sitting on our end tables. We don't need another, um, you know, pair of pants that you really don't like how they fit. We don't need another coat when you already have some. Some of us, we, find, we, we have our style, we know what we like, and we wear it forever, right? So, which reminds me of the mass market is against you. If you go into a mall or you even watch TV at night, it's all about sell, 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 sell. All the companies want to get into your pocket. They want you to spend money. Um, and to wear their name on something, I don't want to, if I'm wearing a Tommy Hilfiger shirt and it says it, why am I advertising for you, Tommy? I don't, you know, or um, Nike or whatever it might be. Why am I buying something to advertise for someone? Because it's a name. And I see too many of our 
young people especially who think they have to wear something with a name on it. Who cares? If it's built sturdy, if it gets the job done for you, it doesn't have to have a name. Now, I digress because if it's Pendleton, it's okay. okay? <laughs> so we have to determine our needs versus wants. And you know that song, more, more, more? How do you like it? How do you like it? Not so good. Because more, more, more just means more stuff to get rid of, more things. It clutters the mind. A proven thing that it relates, escalates your stress. When, when you ask yourself, okay, have you been on a really nice trip? How many of you have been on a really nice trip? Say you took a cruise, maybe you went to Alaska, maybe you did the Great Smoky Mountains, okay. Now I want you to think about what, what comes to mind first about that trip. The very first thing that comes to mind, was it an experience that you had on it or was it the souvenir you bought? How many say it was the experience? Something happened on that trip that you'll never, you can picture it in your mind yet. Um, you know, you can see it. You think about the people you were with. You think about where you were, where you stood there and went, oh. I mean, I was in Alaska and I was looking at Mount Denali and we were as close as you could go with the National Park Service. And the park ranger, I just stood there looking at it. And um, he said, you're really, really lucky. Today is the second day this entire summer where it hasn't been covered in clouds. The summit's exposed. And I said, don't tell me there's not a God when I see something like that. And so I didn't think about the t-shirt I bought that said, I survived, you know, the, uh, um, the what is the name of the, the fishing show? Um, the deep sea fishing show up there in Alaska. I survived. I pulled it out the other day and I was like, oh, I forgot I even had this thing. Well, guess what? It's in the barn pile. Because obviously it didn't mean that much to me. Why did I even buy the dang thing? But I will not regret the pictures I took of Mount Denali and who I stood. I stood next to my friend Lou and we were just gawking at this beautiful site. And I feel I was like rubbing up against her because this person worked with the Mother Teresa for two years. and. And I said, Lou, look at that. And, and I said to her, don't tell me there's not a God. And she said, you got that right. So how fortunate we are that we have experiences. So can we begrudge our grandkids if they don't want our stuff, but they want experiences? Maybe they're on the right path. Um, so sentimental attachments, man, that is our kick in the butt downfall. This was my grandma's great grandma's. This is my friend gave me this and this is, okay. No, you can't throw this away. You can't throw this away because this came from my friend. Um, she moved. Um, so it's a thing. It's a thing. This, this is the experience. This is the person. This is <laughs> thing one and thing two by Dr. Sue. So sentimental attachments, they're the tough things. We had one older lady, we went in and she had a lot of things that she was very sentimentally attached to. We took, she was moving into an assisted living, had a great big house full of things, beautiful things. Kids didn't want them. Don't want them, mom. I'm in North Carolina. I'm not hauling it way down to North Carolina. I'm in Missouri. I don't want it. She was just devastated because all these things that had been in her family for years, nobody wanted them. So what we did was we took pictures. We took pictures of them, we put them in a scrapbook. Along each side of it, there's a little spot where she writes where it was, where it came from. She still has her memories. The memories aren't gone. It's just that now it's not encumbering her anymore. Um, plan of action, sometimes it's just a matter of saying, I am gonna do this. One drawer at a time, I'm gonna do this. And that turns into the baby steps, and it just little, little bit by little bit. But don't leave it for the opportunity where you can't do it anymore. Um, nobody knows if dementia is going to hit them. Nobody knows if a stroke is going to hit them. Um, just remember, right now you have control. Right now you have control to make decisions. 
You have control to take things and put them where you want them to go. You have control to go with the things where you want. Well, I'm going to give you this because you know that crack in it? That's what you did when you were two. It's yours. <laughs> okay? I remember because I cried when you cracked that. Okay? And the kid is going to be like, Poof. okay? But so at least you're, you're moving it along. You're getting it out of your world. Because once you have a situation where you are incapacitated in mind or body, the decision's not yours anymore. So isn't it more fun to dispose of things that mean something to you while you can dispose of them the way you want them? So if it goes to a great niece, or if it goes to your neighbor lady who coveted it for years, then let them be happy and enjoy their happiness. So if you hear me having a recurring message here, it's like, yup, give it away, yup. Send it to someone who will enjoy it. Timelines. This is, you know how the New Year's resolution thing comes out every year? What does it last, maybe six hours um, a day? This is the timeline where you say, where you actually write on a calendar, I'm gonna get rid of this, or this room is gonna be this month, this room is gonna be this month, this room is gonna be this month. And, and you hold yourself accountable to your timelines. And I heard somebody mention earlier the accountability partner. Absolutely, it goes with this too. Do it with your friends, do it together. Um, have some fun. Part of cleaning up or doing this is reliving all those memories that affiliate with it too. And if there's anything that is bad memory related, out. Get it out. You don't need that cloud. You don't need the little black rain cloud bad memory hanging over your head. So, let's see if I can make this work. So, when people say, where do I start? How do I start? What do I do? I tell them to pick your favorite room, tell me why it's your favorite room, and is it just for you? Is it like your own little den, or is it your little sunroom? Is it your living room? Um, my dad used to like the library, which you know always had reading material in it, AKA bathroom. Um, focus on just one room. Paint it your, empty it out, paint it your favorite color, make it what you always dreamed for it to be, okay? And then, Gradually, you can add other rooms. But make these rooms your favorite colors. Make them the colors that make you happy. And who cares if somebody else doesn't like it? It's not their house. It's not their room. Make you happy with what you want it. And that is my favorite place to tell people to start. If your kitchen is your favorite room because you love to bake and you like to give away those things, you like to um, create in your kitchen, but your kitchen is a zoo, then start in your kitchen and make it even more enjoyable for you to use. So when you have goals and accomplishments, um, then you involve the world of relaxation, tranquility, peaceful, you're happy. I had one lady, we were the first people that she allowed in her house in 15 years. She was so ashamed and embarrassed of her house. For us, it's like another day at the office, okay? It's kind of like the old saying about the, the uh, gynecologist when you have to go, like you're like, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta clean everything out. And it's like, okay, how many is he seeing today? 15, 20, you're gonna blend into the mass, right? <laughs> I hope that's true. But I can tell you that for us, when we walk into a place, it's like we've done so many of them now that it really is like no big deal. You can't surprise me. So the end goals for you are, are you peaceful in your home? Are you happy in your home? If your friend unexpectedly showed up, do you open the door and say, come on in? And can they go to your bathroom at any minute and use it and enjoy? visiting with you in your home or if you don't if your home doesn't give you those feelings and you feel guilty that you can't do your quilting or your scrapbooking or your coloring book or whatever because you have to do your house cleaning first but you're tired so you're just going to plunk down and watch tv and eat and supper in front of the tv again then you know maybe it's time to like back up a little bit and reassess where you want to be 
And there is no right or wrong here. It's your home. It's what you're comfortable with. But if in the back of your head, you're saying to yourself, I am not, I can't do this because I need to do this instead. Oh, this is a mess. Oh, don't look in there. Oh, you know, then those are little jabs in your butt telling you to get moving. Is there any questions? Yes. Oh, like sometimes you keep stuff because you feel guilty because you know, your mother said this is, you got to pass this down. And you know, anybody pass it down to, but you, you know, so I've been doing that the last few years. I put things on display that she had, but I pared it down a lot, a lot. And, but then some stuff I think she says, well, you can sell that, you know, and make money. And you know, that's what she said to me, which is, you know, and I thought, I think that too. Do you go on eBay? Do you try to do yes. eBay stuff? And does it cost a lot? Do they take a lot out? Yes, it or depends. People try to stand <laughs> Number one, um, all, all sales sites have some kind of, there's some work involved in them and the gratification isn't really quick in some cases. Um, eBay, <coughs> eBay resellers take anywhere from 35 to 65% normally. Um, it's a good place to get rid of some things. Um, it depends on what you wanna do. My big question for you is, does your mom want you to be happy? Yes. So your mom, your mom doesn't want you to feel guilty. She'd say, "Why are you keeping that old thing?" So. It's it's not fair. It's not fair to her, for her to project that on. The best thing you can do in honor of your mom is to give it sell it or share it with someone else who would have the same happy feelings when they're with it. So if someone buys it on eBay, if, if somebody buys it on eBay and they're spending the money on it, they're buying it for a reason. Is it 60% you said? Up to. Well, eBay takes a chunk. eBay, there's a quite a, if you haven't done eBay sales, there's quite a bit of setup to it. And then they're very, um, they're very structured about um, how you how you wrap things, how you send them. If there is anything that uh, if there's anything in there that comes broken, the buyer will throw a fit and give you a bad review. So there's a uh, there's professional eBayers who who have all of that under control. Yeah, and I'm sorry to tell you that um, that is probably one of the least marketable things right now. Yeah, certain Barbies, yes. Certain Barbies because the 60s children are still out there with their Barbies. Like you hear the I Dream of Jeannie Dow was like 200 or something. Yes. Thing that my you got to remember when you look at eBay too, when you look at eBay or you look something up on eBay, yeah. it is what the person wants for it in most like cases. And, and it oftentimes does not sell for that. Yeah. They, if they do a buy it now or whatever. So. It, no, it depends on if you're marketing it through someone who does it for you oh. or if you're doing it on your own. But if you streamline it through um, someone who does it for you, the really good ones take up to 65% sometimes. So, yes, Louise. Honey, I'd love to pick your brain. Yesterday, I got involved in a discussion about bed bugs. Oh, yes. So tell me everything you know about bed bugs and who is a good provider for extermination? Bed bugs are um, the number one leading health hazard in Michigan right now. Uh, the growth of the bed bug uh, epidemic, if you will, is huge. Saginaw and Bay City are having huge, huge epidemic bed bug issues. Um, bed bugs are very resilient um, creatures. They like it, they like it um, cooler. Um, bed bugs in a trailer house will go down when they hear, if there's a heat source or if there's a fumigation effort, um, bed bugs will crawl into electrical outlets. They'll crawl behind the wood on your molding. Um, they'll even in like, especially crawl space homes or whatever, they'll go down through and get in a lower level. So you can, er eradicate and they'll just come back. 
Um, there was one place that I inspected. It was a trailer home, a mobile home. My suggestion to that was to burn it. They were so full. And the, the problem with bed bugs is, I, A, I will tell you, be very, very, very cautious about buying any furniture at a yard sale or a garage sale. Um, never ever buy a bed or, or bed springs. Secondhand, I would not take them unless it was someone in the family that you knew and personally could vouch for it. Um, they're finding them in uh, sofas you flip over a sofa, you vacuum like crazy on the sofa, you flip it over, well, they just all went to the bottom of the sofa. Um, we, we as a company always refer these kind of jobs because I have so many customers that are regular cleaning customers and so many customers that are like um, downsizing to go into um, a, a kind of um, assisted living or, you know, advanced homes like that that if we know there's a bed bug issue we won't even we won't take it because I cannot take the chance on contaminating anyone else's home and I won't and I don't want my employees um, who are um, going into these homes I don't want them taking anything home either so we just say no but in the situation of bed bugs um, extermination companies have to be very resilient. It's a lot of callbacks. You've got to know the life cycle of the bug. Um, they can live for over six months without any food. That's a long time to go without having anybody to chew on. And so because they can live so long independently like that without a host, uh, and they can still lay eggs in that interim, um, it's a very, very serious situation. Um, I don't even like to, if I travel and I take my suitcase somewhere, um, I have a special liner in my suitcase. I have a bed bug spray. I flip back the bed right away and look. Um, sometimes you get what you pay for, and other times you bring home little friends when you come home. So it's a, it's a hard, it's a, I don't have an easy answer for it by any means. But as far as a good exterminator, um, independents are usually pretty good, but it is a very long, drawn-out process to fully exterminate them. First of all, everything that's fabric in your home needs to be washed. It needs to be washed at, like, in hot water. I love bleach. And then dried in a dryer. Okay, so now you take into accountability the fabrics that can't handle high heat. And think about even your pillows on your couch pillows on your bed they can all be um, infected with this parasite I mean they're horrible so I don't know if that helps you a little bit but it, the first did. thing I didn't realize that it was a process before but yeah I know we've had quite a problem in Sanilac County yes yeah, Sanilac County is is have an issue every bad X bad X has got a few issues um, I've got some one thing I have here to help you on your goals if you're if you're looking at making goals this is just an errand and to-do sheet but you can make copies of it and feel free to list things in here you can put your own little goals like I'm gonna clean that dang back bedroom out this week or I'm gonna clean that fruit cellar or I'm gonna don't feel bad ask yourself the question would I buy it again um, is it, is it clean? Would I feel right about giving it to my granddaughter to play with? And if you don't feel right about it, then get rid of it. Empty your mind. So I'll let you pass those around. And then um, senior rehoming, I'll just say really fast. Um, senior rehoming is getting to be a bigger and bigger thing. There's a lot of stress and anxiety and related to senior rehoming. Um, the one of the biggest things people have an issue with with senior rehoming is what the, the new assisted living won't let me have my cat. What am I going to do with my cat? It's not so much about the physical attributes in their home, it's about their pets. So we've even helped uh, find new homes for pets. So I'll give you that one to push around. Some assisted livings let you keep your pet, small ones. Um, this is just a a little list about things twice a year minimum that you should think about purging and um, 
what you want to do with old linens and things like that that you don't need anymore, uh, a lot of places like your secondhand stores will take them and uh, or give them to a machine shop for rags. They'll use them up. And this is just a list of all the various things that our company does. And then we actually have a little giveaway. Um, wow. Thank it's, you. It's not Thank much, but here's a little thing if you want to. It's a little bass or a little bag. And I'll send these this way. Okay. There's my card. Do you want to send a pen around with a sign? Oh, sure. Seat? Yeah, let's. Or do you want to do it? Who has the birthday closest to mine? Oh. <laughs> and then we'll. Then you don't. Your birthday or mine, Louise? Oh, it could be yours. You're our guest, Connie. Oh. <laughs> When's your birthday? Day and month. Um, I am Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Does anybody know who, when that is? That's my birthday, December 8th. Okay. I'm close, but I can't December 22nd. Ooh, Christmas time. December 22nd also. Any? <laughs> Are you both December 22nd? Wow. Okay. Um, Louise, let's do yours because we have a tie. Okay. April 21st. April 2nd. April 21st. Any April birthdays? I have April 2nd. You're okay. the closest. There you go. Congratulations. Wow. There you go. Enjoy. And I just want to really, really quick, just for fun, I just want to tell you this. I am not, um, this a is not my skill. I am not a puppeteer. But I just want to tell you. She's got her necklace. Okay. Oh, quit eating your necklace, Granny. It is okay <laughs> to give away my china. <laughs> It is okay <laughs> to pass it on. So anyway, I read stories to my grandkids awesome. with these. So thank you again for having me. Have a wonderful day. And don't hesitate to call me anytime if you have a question. Thank you, Connie. Mm -hmm.